Hi, my name is Dr. Simon Fry, a consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the very difficult subject of brain tumour related epilepsy. If you have already seen some of the other videos on the channel, if you haven't already supported me uh, by hitting that subscribe button down below, I'd be very grateful for that. So this story actually starts in the heyday of Victorian England, where the National Hospital for the Paralytic and uh, Epileptic uh, was established, now known as the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery at Queen Square. And its founding fathers comprise of some of the greatest minds in uh, neurology and neuroscience. And pictured here before you is Sir Victor Horsley on the left and on the right, John Hewlings Jackson. Sir Victor Horsley was very much the forefather of modern neurosurgery and John Hewlings Jackson, apart from being uh, basically the forefather of modern neurology as we now know it, had a particular expertise in epilepsy too. The coming together of these great minds in the 1860s was really important because it was appreciable that those with brain tumours could develop epilepsy and removing of said brain tumour could cure the epilepsy. The fact that tumours can cause epilepsy is usually as a result of the tumour itself residing in the brain. Now, of course, the, it can occur as an indirect effect of it occurring elsewhere, uh, but for the purposes of this video, I'm going to be concentrating on brain tumours themselves. And of course, we think about it in very simple terms on the whole. Well, there's a, a tumour over there, it shouldn't be there, it's causing some irritation, and therefore the epilepsy. But as we're going to discover, the mechanisms underneath it are actually quite complex and worthy of some consideration. Approximately 1 in 10,000 people will develop a brain tumour and for those who are developing a brain tumour, about 40% its first manifestation will be an epileptic seizure. About 20% it will occur a bit later on into the course of the disease. The frequency of seizures will very much depend on the tumour type, location, the amount and more about that later. They tend to be focal and then may or may not spread and become secondary generalized and the manifestation the semiology of the type of seizure will very much depend on the location of where those tumors are and the outcome will again vary by tumor type and, and tumor location going back to a little bit of basic biology with all of this because it's important to appreciate that in terms of the type of cells involved and the names of them. In terms of brain cells, we broadly divide the brain cells into two groups. We actually have the neurons, those that generate and send the signals, and then we have the support cells, which are known as the glia. The glia from the old Greek term of glue, because it was thought that these support cells glue everything together. In terms of the support cells, there tend to be um, three major groups. Of course, there are more, but there are astrocytes, which maintain the chemical environment for nerve signaling. We have the oligodendrocytes, which provide the myelin sheaths of the central nervous system. And then we have the microglia, which perform immune functions to protect the brain and also caretaker functions as well to mop up bits of uh, dead tissue as well. We have meningeal cells, which form the layers covering the brain itself. We have blood vessels and we have glands, and those all come together to give us the brain that we uh, know and love. Tumours are, of course, abnormal, uncontrolled growths of cells in the body. Why that happens is very complex, not for now, but in terms of how we think about them, we think about them as either being primary, that's arising from the organ that we find them in, or secondary, where they've come from somewhere else, they've metastasized in from somewhere. And in fact, it's quite interesting this, uh, the majority of metastatic brain tumors arise from really just three groups of cancers, namely melanomas, about 50%, um, lung cancers, about 40%, and breast cancers, about 20% of those will go to the brain. In terms of their behavior, we can also think about them um, as either being benign, or malignant, so benign ones tend to stay where they are, and malignant ones tend to spread elsewhere. Now, even though something might be a benign brain cancer, it's important to remember that the brain is an enclosed space. We have this soft uh, tissue jelly-like substance, which is the brain, housed inside the calvarium, the skull vault of the brain, and any growth in there can cause problems, particularly a large growth, or depending on exactly where it's at, uh, can cause some very significant issues. So even a benign brain tumour can cause significant problems. 
Now there are lots of different types of brain tumour. This is the World Health Organization list of recognised uh, classified uh, brain tumours. There are over 150 of them in this list. So there are many, many different types of brain tumour. And in terms of their grading, whether they are benign or malignant or somewhere along that spectrum, we have different types of grades. In 2016, there was quite a significant change in how we classify them. And in fact, um, they now include not only the uh, appearances just down the microscope, what we call the histology, but also various molecular and genetic markers as well. And because of that, it's actually quite difficult to explain in simple layman's terms um, how the grading actually works for individual types of cancers. But the important thing to take away though is that we have more benign ones in terms of behavior, they tend to be slower growing, tend to stay where they are, and then we have the malignant ones which tend to be faster growing and tend to spread. Well, different tumor types actually have different rates of epileptogenicity. Um, so we have some of the benign ones known as DNETs and gangliogliomas, uh, and something like a 90 to 100% of those will actually cause seizures. Um, these tend to occur in the teenage years, they are benign, they are slow growing, but boy do they cause epilepsy and epileptic uh, related problems. They tend to occur mostly in the temporal uh, lobes, can occur in the frontal lobes as well, but they're usually anti-epileptic medication resistant. Often they cause focal onset seizures and they're known collectively as LEETS, low grade epilepsy associated tumours. Um, we have some of the low grade gliomas where about 70% of those who have them will end up with epileptic seizures. These tend to occur in the mid 30s for people and they are usually associated with secondary generalized seizures and about half of them will be anti-epileptic medication resistant. We then have some of the high-grade gliomas where the rates of epilepsy may be 50% tend to occur in people who are in their mid 60s and onwards and it might be 50-50 whether they are focal only or focal with secondary generalization. And then we have the meningiomas um, where in about 30% of, of cases uh, people will develop epilepsy but actually in terms of their seizure freedom they tend to do actually quite well um, in the long run with about 60 to 70 percent of them being seizure free. So there's a bit of a paradox here in fact where we have benign slower tumours tending to have on the whole as a general rule um, higher rates of epilepsy uh, and epileptic seizures um, compared to some of the higher grade uh, type of tumours, those which are more likely to be metastatic and faster growing, where uh, they have slightly lower rates of tumours. And because of this, it's really important for us to appreciate that with those who are having better and, and longer survival, that they're going to be more affected by epilepsy and its effects and being able, having to live with the consequences of it are uh, you know, increasingly important, whether in terms of quality of life, work, cognition, memory, and it's not just about the actual uh, brain tumour itself, it's not just about the epilepsy itself, but also in terms of the anti-epileptic medications, because sometimes these can cause issues too. So it's not just about the brain tumour. And those who may have malignant tumours with shorter survivals, quality of life, palliation is also critically important. No one wants to see a patient having intractable seizures in their last months. So we've already discussed that different tumours have got different rates um, and that will depend very much on uh, what the type of uh, the tumour is. Where it is um, as well will be very important not just in terms of the lobes of the brain uh, with the uh, temporal and frontal lobes having particularly high rates of epilepsy but also proximity to functional areas as well uh, which are more likely to manifest themselves with seizures uh, but also in terms of treatment too so if, if a tumour is closer to a functional area it can often be harder to fully resect it also very much depend on how many lesions there are and the size of them as well. The other thing to consider is what we call the peritumor environment. So it's not just about the tumor, but what happens around the tumor as well. So in terms of the peritumor environment, we have hypoxia. Um, so there's a lack of oxygen 
going to uh, the, the brain tissue, edema, that swelling, that edema can also contain inflammatory cells, cytokines, which can cause activation of seizures, pH, if it's more of an acidotic environment as well, the integrity of what we call the blood-brain barrier can also be impaired, iron concentrations, iron channel function, receptors, neurotransmitter changes, intracellular signaling, molecular and enzyme changes, and of course the genetics both of the tumour itself and of the person who is affected by the tumour. Not only do we have issues relating to the brain cancer, but also um, systemically as well. There may be electrolyte imbalances as a result of various things. There may be chemotherapy side effects too to consider, and that's particularly in the case of um, brain cancers which are being treated by intrathecal um, chemotherapy that can be irritative as well to the brain and of course there are paraneoplastic syndromes which I'm not going to go into in this video. In terms of treatment historically and even still to today um, treatment is very much about treating the actual tumour itself. It's really important to try and remove as much of the tumour as possible, to have very clear uh, margins of resection as well. Some of the things which can uh, have an adverse effect as well in terms of seizure freedom are time that people have with seizures. So the longer someone's had seizures for as a result of the tumour, that can have a negative impact so too um, can having secondary generalized seizures as well and the general sort of preoperative seizure um, control also plays uh, a factor as well. Sometimes epilepsy can present only after the brain tumor surgery that can either be as an unfortunate consequence of uh, trauma to surrounding tissues, can be as a result of scar tissue formation or it can even be a herald of, of uh, tumour recurrence as well. So quite complicated. Um, in terms of prophylactic anti-epileptic medication, so for example, someone's got a particular type of brain tumour, um, haven't had any seizures, they're going to have an operation to resect it. Is there a role for giving um, anti-epileptic medications just in case that they might go on to develop seizures afterwards? There doesn't seem to be a role for that, although there are, of course, exceptions. And that's a very much an individual thing to be discussed with one's individual oncology and neurosurgical teams. Of course, there's a, a role for the general uh, treatment of the tumours to reduce um, the secondary effect of epilepsy in terms of radiotherapy, chemotherapy as well. And if we think about the anti-epileptic medications, there's quite a variety of them. They have different mechanisms of actions and, of course, side effect profiles too. So there's some very individual things to be thinking about for an individual patient with an individual type of tumour. We also have to think about, as well, the type of anti-epileptic medication and the chemotherapy, because each one can have effects on the other. And um, it's also important to think about, as well, that some anti-epileptic med medications in certain circumstances can actually help to suppress the cancer as well. So we know, for example, that sodium valproate can actually increase survival in those with GBMs. Thank you very much. I hope that was a useful overview of what is a very tricky, complicated and difficult subject really to talk about. Um, I hope you have a better appreciation that it's not just about an abnormal growth of cells uh, causing some irritation uh, and that's the end of it. It's far more complicated than that. Um, I do wish everyone uh, all the very best. Um, I can't take um, individual questions really on this subject as I hope you appreciate now it's just such an individualised topic. Um, thank you very much for watching. Please do consider supporting that channel by hitting that subscribe button down below and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.